Well, greetings, brethren. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath to you all. Each day we pick up the newspaper and we can read about young men who have gone off to war battling physical enemies in the world and wind up, in some cases, unfortunately, coming home to their families in a very sad way as being casualties of these wars. Oftentimes they're picked off either by snipers or grenades or some kind of ambush attack that they've encountered in their life. And yet ultimately those things don't have a, a final effect on this war that they're involved in, but it does have an effect on the pain and the suffering of the families and the friends of those who they go home to and the morale of the country in the, in the, as a whole. And as well, brethren, over the last oh, 17 or 20 years, many in the Church of God have also fallen victim by the adversary's attack. They have gone back to the world, gone back home, and in some cases, those who have dropped by the boards and have quit may have also lost what they were looking for. We, as God's people today, are in a battle, and we are fighting for our life, our eternal life, salvation. And there's something that we need to be doing in this battle that we're involved in that will help us to survive this. God's Word has warned us that we would be continually attacked and that we need to be watching and be aware and ready so that we will not be a casualty. The GIs out in the world are looking to make it home. We as God's people have our eyes set on the kingdom. That's what we're headed for. And in order to do that, we're going to look at the word, God's Word today and see that there's something that we need to be doing in order for us to be at the wedding supper and that we won't be a casualty of this adversary that's trying to destroy us. Let's turn over to, Ch uh, to, do, to Jude, um, Jude 1 in verse 3. Jude 1 and verse 3. And let's see a warning that is given us here as God's people to be on guard, to be watching. Jude in verse 3, it says, Dear friends, and I'm reading this in the NIV here, although I was very eager to write unto you about the salvation which we share, he was eager to bring them a message, something that he wanted to talk to them about concerning salvation. He says, Although I felt I had to write and urge you earnestly to contend for the faith that was once delivered for all and entrusted to the saints. He's saying here that he was compelled to warn us about contending for the faith. I was eager to write you about the salvation, but I felt I had to urge you on something else. Because he saw something else going on with them that he needed to advise them and warn them about. And we also today, as much as we want to look at the salvation that we're looking for, we need to be urged, as he's saying here, for what he was warning them about. To earnestly contend for the faith. Human nature, brethren, loses enthusiasm and zeal if it is not continually spurred on. We have to keep it alive. Christ says the, the end time church is lukewarm. They're lacking this zeal, this enthusiasm. And at the very end of the uh, admonition to Revelations uh, uh, chapter 3 on the lay of the sea in church, he tells them you need to get zeal. You need to repent and get zeal so you don't have to go through this tribulation. There is something that we have an opportunity now to do to change things so that we won't have to go through this. We won't have to be martyrs at the end time before Christ returns. Whenever we are becoming lukewarm, whenever we're not having this attitude of contending for the faith, it's like taking your foot off the gas, the gas pedal in your car. You know, you can be driving along 60 miles an hour, take your foot off the gas, and eventually you're going to come to a stop. If you're not continually pushing it down and staying with it, we will begin to fall back. Most, con most uh, we must rather continual, continually struggle to hold on to the faith. Because that's what he's warning us here, to contend for the faith. That word contend that he brings out there in the original is epogonism apogonizomia, and it means to struggle, to earnestly contend for something, or to contend with an adversary. In other words, being in a battle, to strive to accomplish something, to fight, to labor fervently, to strive. He's saying here, in other words, it's to contend as a combatant in battle, because that's what we're involved in. We're in a battle. 
Just like those young men that are in a battle for their physical life, we are striving today to hold on to what, we're, what we've been given. And again, the intensity that is placed on what he's urging, urging us about, that he says that we are to earnestly contend for that. Earnestly. The war, brethren, is not over. When Worldwide you know, finally broke up and things you know, started going in different directions and people went this place or that place, it didn't end there. The adversary did not go off to some island and relax in some kind of a retreat. No, he's very, out, very much out there trying to continue to destroy. Continuing in verse 4 in Jude, he says, For there are certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago and have secretly slipped in among you. They've crept in to the church of God through these years. And these were men, he says, of condemnation. That was pr prophesied to happen. Now again, remember, he came here with this letter, I wanted to talk to you about the salvation, but I need to, to warn you that you need to contend for the faith. And then in verse 5, he's telling us here, verse 4 and 5, because there are certain people who have come in among you that are going to try to destroy you. And they are godless men who change the grace of our Lord into a license for immorality. And they deny Jesus Christ our sovereign and Lord. Verse 5. <clears throat> Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt. Now he goes through this and he's telling them of all the things that they went through, that God protected them, <clears throat> God kept them. And he goes on here and he's talking about these individuals. <clears throat> In verse 6 he says, And the angels did not keep their first estate, but they left their habitation, and they're reserved in chains in darkness till the judgment. Verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around about them in like manner. And going uh, in, in over, being involved with fornication and going after strange flesh, and they set forth an example of suffering and vengeance of eternal fire, as an example of what is waiting for the future for people who will not give in or re, or uh, yield to God's direction. Likewise, verse eight: these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending for the devil. He disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Dropping down to verse 11. He says, Woe to them, because they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed to profit for Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Showing even the examples that we can read in the Bible of other things that God says that individuals were doing to take people away, ultimately by their example. Balaam's era of doing things to deceive people for the financial gain. Others wanting the power for themselves, wanted to, to come in and take over from Moses, the, the office that he had, because they felt they were entitled to that as well, but that's not what God wanted. Verse 12, he says, These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, their clouds without rain, blown uh, along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. There are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars, for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Verse 16, he says, These men are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. You know, they use that, you know, that uh, boasting for themselves or, or flattering other people for their own advantage, to take advantage of people, to make them look like they're the ones of importance. Verse 17, but dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Christ foretold. They said, they said to you in the last times there would be scoffers who would follow their ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. So he was very concerned about God's people at this point and warning them that they needed to contend for this faith. That it's a struggle that we have to hold on. And in struggling for this faith that he's talking about here, that word is uh, pistos in the original Greek. It's P-I-S-T-O-S. And again, that word means conviction or assurance. What is our conviction or assurance of the faith that we are holding on to? How strongly are we holding to that? And again, this is a way of life that we're living that is based on faith and conviction. And if we don't have that, 
We're going to be ripped away. We don't have that armor on. We're not being protected. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter also is warning us today. 1 Peter chapter 5. The King James says, Be sober and vigilant. 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8. Be sober and vigilant. Uh, vigilant. And again, the, the uh, NIV states it. Be self-controlled and alert. Because your enemy, we have an enemy. Make no doubt about it. There is an enemy that wants to destroy us. And he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Verse 9. Resist him, standing firm. The King James says, Steadfast standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Again, brethren, we are truly in a battle with powers that we cannot see. This is not like we can, you know, scope in on the enemy and, you know, shoot a missile in. This doesn't happen like that. We are the targets. They can work on us, but we can't see them. Verse 10, he goes on and shows that, but we're not without hope. He says, in the God of all grace who called you to this eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So ultimately, ultimately we know that Christ and the Father are going to be helping us through this. We know that. He's coming back and he's going to restore these things. But until then, as God's people and the targets of the adversary, we need to be holding fast. Because that's what our responsibility is. That's what we are to do today. And that's what this sermon is about. Holding fast. We can go back in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's turn there real quickly and notice what Paul tells us here. Ephesians 6. And in verse 12. Ephesians 6 and in verse 12, Paul says here, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not dealing with something we can see. And he tells us, as he goes on through the rest of these verses, that we're to take on this armor that is going to help us, this armor that we can use to protect us during this onslaught. So we can go through that at another time and you can read that you know, on your own. But there are things here he's laying out for us that we need to put on daily so that we walk out that door, we are protected. You know, I've, I've talked to people and they say, well, you know, I, can, I pray in the morning. I get up and I pray and, or I go to bed at night and I pray and I ask God to give me help or direction or guidance, help me to see things in my life. He says, the minute I walk out the door, something is there to attack me. You know, somebody in a car is cutting in front of you. Someone at work says something to upset you. You get a phone call from someone and says someone said something that hurt you or offended you. Immediately, the adversary is there. We need to be aware of that. We can't forget that once we walk out that door each day, Satan is going to try to attack us. Turn to Acts chapter 14. Let's notice something here about Paul. Paul tells us that we're in a battle, that we're being you know, attacked. And we can hear him tell us that. And we say, you know, oftentimes we say, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to say. You know, you tell us this, and, you know, we hear a sermon, we get a Bible study, and, yeah, the minister can say this and that. But what about what I'm going through and I'm in my life? Well, Paul didn't just say it. He experienced it. Acts chapter 14 and in verse 19. It says, there came there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, now, I, I don't think we've been stoned. I don't think we've gone through some of the experiences that Paul does lay out for us, shipwrecked and left uh, for dead in, in different places, having a, you know, uh, a snake wrapped on his hand. Who persuaded the people, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They stoned him, and then they carried him outside and dropped him off as a dead man. Verse 20. However, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. So here's Paul, who was stoned. And God didn't allow him to be dead. He allowed him to get up and go back with, part, with Barnabas to Derbe. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had, he had taught many, 
They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They went back there again. Because these, these, uh, you know, these Jews that were from Antioch, he went back to where they came from. And verse 22, continuing, uh, confirming rather, the souls of this, the, the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Now he's going back now and telling them you need to continue on in the faith because he says, through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. Now he spoke from experience. He's not someone saying, hey, you know, these are tough, tough times for you. So, you know, you need to hang in there. He's, no, I went through these things. I was stoned, left for dead. God raised me up so that I wasn't dead. In the uh, uh, Amplified Bible, verse 22 reads, And establishing and strengthening the souls and the hearts of the disciples, urging and warning and encouraging them to stand firm in the faith. In other words, to hold on to the faith. Hold fast and telling them that it is through many hardships and tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. In spite of the things that we see around us, brethren, today, you know, that we're living in very comfortably in this environment and wherever you may be uh, watching this or listening, we live in a very comfortable place, these United States. We go to bed at night, for the most part, very safe and sound. Very few times will we see about people invading homes and doing terrible things. But we, for the most part, have been blessed. We're protected by God as God's people. But in spite of that, in spite of what we see around us, we also realize that the end is very soon. Things are unraveling right before our eyes. And with this admonition for us today, we need to stand firm. Because it is close. Don't be caught off guard because we are comfortably living here. We have enough food. We have all the comforts, the creature comforts that we enjoy. That's soon going to change here. Where are we going to be when those things happen? If we're not holding fast, we're not going to be where Christ is. We're not going to be there. Many brethren have gone back into the world who heard the truth preached. Others don't see the impending doom that lie just ahead. Some are being just, you know, not told what's going on. They're not really hearing these things. Some are yearning for the good old days. Why can't it be like it was years ago? Well, it's not. We're getting very close to the time of where Christ says we need to be working on ourselves. This end time church, he said, is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't see how bad you are. You're being, there's a covering over your eyes. He says, use eye salve so you can see. We don't see what's happening before our eyes, how close we are. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians 13. Every year at the Passover, we are, are told to be examining ourselves. We're to look at ourselves and see what, what is our spiritual condition. How are we stacking up as we approach the Passover? Are we growing and overcoming? Well, it's not something that we just do with the Passover. That's not the only time we should be examining ourselves. 2 Corinthians in verse, uh, chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says here, Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. So it's not only a matter of our examining ourselves and our spiritual condition as, as far as our sins are concerned and, and whether we're growing. He says here, Examine to see whether you're holding to yourselves. Test yourselves. Put yourselves to the test. Do you not realize that Christ is in you unless you fail to meet the test? I'm reading that in the, R, the uh, Revised Standard Version. And Paul here is, was, was constantly warning God's people to be watching, to be alert. How many times were they warned about uh, individuals that would take them away? From within you, he told the, in, in the book of Acts. He warned them. From within, these things are going to happen. So the dire warning is always there. And if we're not careful with these warnings, we're not holding them dearly and realizing this is very important for us to listen to and keep to, in our minds, we're not going to be there. We're going to fall away. 2 Corinthians 11, going back a couple of chapters. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly. Well, if you just put up with me a little while I tell you this. You know, understand what I have to say. Don't turn away. Just bear with me a little and, and, and listen. He says, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. 
This wasn't a man who was jealous for something for himself. There was nothing he was looking to gain. Here's a man who was being stoned and, and, and uh, left for dead. He had a jealousy of God for, for them, God's jealousy for them. A, a deep passion for the welfare of, of another. That's the godly jealousy. A deep passion for the welfare of another. He said, I'm, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin. He's letting them know that this concern he has for them was that for their being the bride of Christ. He says, I'm concerned that if you don't listen, if you're not following the instruction, the direction that I give, I'm not going to be able to present you as this chaste bride. Even back then, Paul is showing his mission was to what? Prepare the bride. And he was concerned enough to let them know that I, I have a passion to present you as a chaste virgin, a virgin uh, to Christ. But I fear, he says, I'm concerned by any means as, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so will your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that has preached another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, that you might well bear with him. I'm concerned that you're going to go along with these things, even to the extent that they're bringing uh, another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit, that, she'd fall, that you'll fall prey to that. Just as the, the serpent beguiled Eve, we can also be deceived away from the truth if we're not holding fast to what we've been given, holding fast to this faith that we have. So this urgency must be ongoing. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in verse 12, again, telling Timothy here, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab hold of it. Hang on to it. Because that's all we have in this physical life is the truth of God. That's all we have here that we are looking forward to. God gave us everything we need right here in this book. And he says, lay hold on eternal life. And we, have, we lay hold on that eternal life when we are drinking in what this word says. Hold on to eternal life whereunto you are called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Not to let it get away. Don't let it get away from us. This pearl of great price that we have been given we can't put it down under any circumstances by being lax in how we're looking at it and how we're living. Dropping down to verse 19, 1 Timothy 6, he says, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on this eternal life. And going on, he says, so Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding uh, profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Again, Paul telling them how they needed to hang on, hold on to the promise of eternal life. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at the time we're living in today. Now we see Paul's concern for them at that time, and he's telling us now for our time as well. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, be judge, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. This was the instruction Paul is giving Timothy here. Your responsibility now, Timothy, is to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, with patience. Continue teaching, enduring in teaching. Holding on in teaching. He says, because in verse 3, there's going to come a time that they will not endure sound doctrine. I say, you've got to stay on it. You've got to continue to preach the word in season, out of season. They will not endure sound doctrine, but they will, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Endure afflictions. Hold on. Hold fast, Timothy, because you've got a tremendous responsibility because the people eventually at the end time, as he's instructing the ministry today through this uh, teaching to, to Timothy, 
The ministry today also has this responsibility to do this because we've come to the time through the years where they will not endure sound doctrine. They would not accept sound teaching, replacing it for things that make them in some, in some ways feel good. People want to be emotionally uh, titillated in some way so that they feel better about things. They want their own way and they've allowed themselves in this way to be deceived because that's not what the Bible tells us. We're not here to, to walk away saying they felt good about something, but rather we need to realize what an important responsibility that we've been given. They won't accept the truth, but rather have others think and study for them. And I remember distinctly someone coming to me one time and said when, when things were getting you know, really out of hand back in the... Uh, mid-90s, someone said to me, well, you know, when asked about, you know, what do you think about what's happening, they said, well, that's, I don't worry about that. That's the minister's job to be studying these things. You know, he tells me what to do, and then I just follow that along. Well, I don't know where that individual is today, but certainly did not adhere to the instruction that God tells us to prove all things and hold fast, because that's what we're doing, holding fast right now. And today we look around and we have the internet. Well, there are probably hundreds. I know there's been hundreds of churches out there through the years, but now everyone's got their own website, preaching their own brand of um, whatever they learned through the years from uh, the Church of God. And it varies. And if you go on some of these websites, you say, oh, look, they've oh, they got the Sabbath, they've got the Holy Days. It really seems like they've got a lot going on here. And then you find out they're talking about, you know, you have to know how to, exactly how to say God's name or uh, how to write it, how to pronounce it, or you have to be careful uh, that, what, that we are not, you know, keeping the holy days at the wrong time and we've got a different calendar. You know, you go to each, each website, they've got a different calendar. How many, how many days are there in the year that you would observe? You want the Passover on the 15th? Well, try this website. Uh, you don't like the date of the feast? Certainly we've got a website for you there. Pick a feast or pick a date and you'll find a group that will help you there. That is what he's saying here at this time. People, they think because people came out of the background that we had, everybody is fine and they're not. There are people out there who don't have what we understand to be the truth. And a lot of the truth is out there. But are they really focused on what, what Paul was saying earlier in espousing God's people to be the bride of Christ? Are they jealous for that? Are they dying for that? Is that their, 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 their heart's desire to be preparing God's people or just continuing on passing information as time goes on? Is it any wonder that, that Jude was so concerned? Because Paul, as he's preparing the church for our time, is also very concerned. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13. Paul says here, but there will be evil men and seducers and they're going to wax worse and worse. It's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And believe me, I see that. I hear all kinds of ideas and stories out there that people have about what they think is the truth of God. Little variations, stepping away, little by little, they get further away from the truth. Verse 14, he says, but continue you in the things which you have learned. Continue what you learned, that you proved it, you, that you made this your foundation. That without any doubt in your mind, you know what it means, the nature of God. You know what it is, whether or not Christ uh, could have sinned. You know what the truth of God is because you've proved it. He says, continue in the things that you did learn, the truth, and that you have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. Know that source. Because people are going out today, they're getting it from all over the place. You know, somebody teaches, you know, one thing one year and then they change it another year. They're changing their, their beliefs left and right. Know who you have learned the truth from. Verse 15. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures that are able to keep you wise unto salvation. What did we talk about earlier? This word that God gave us is all we need. There are no books out there that are going to help us. There are no, there are no you know, uh, psychology books that are going to help us change and grow. It's through the word of God that we learn how to live. Verse 16, and he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. And now we're, we're going to start coming, as we go along here, to the key quality, again, that we are looking for. 
Daniel chapter 12. Paul said earlier that the, the scriptures make us wise to salvation. We just read that. Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 10, it says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The scriptures make us wise unto salvation, and Daniel's telling us here that we will be, the, the wise will understand, because the scriptures give us that understanding. The scriptures will make us wise to salvation if we are yielding to it, if we are holding to it. How can we then contend for the faith? What must we do to be avoiding being the next casualty of Satan, the devil? Turn to First Thessalonians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and, and as travail upon a woman, a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should take you as a thief. Because this world is going to be overtaken without realizing what's happening. Like a thief. Many in the church of God through the years that were coming through the church of God, uh, that walked away from the church of God, he says, are also going to be taken like a thief. Like as a thief. But you, he says, you're not in darkness. Those who have the, that are wise to salvation, those that are studying this word like their life depends on it, he says, you're not in darkness that, they would, that that day would overtake you. You all are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. This is not a time to just sit back, kick back, and throw our feet up and say, well, we have all these you know, articles and study things we've had for years. No, this is not a time for that. We need to be sober, watching, he says. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, they're drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, vigilant, putting on the breastplate of faith and hope, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Again, more armor. He's laying out here for us more that we are to be putting this armor on as a type of battle that we're involved in, a war. Verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Dropping down in verse 21, again, he says, Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Because we're not of the night, we're of the day. So how do we survive this is by proving all things and holding fast. Hold firmly to the truth of God. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 and beginning, in, well, in verse 9. God tells us here, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Who, is the, who are the ones that are going to have knowledge? And who will learn from this? Who's going to have, who will he make to understand? He'll give this understanding to. He says, Those that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breasts. Those that are desiring more from the word of God than just the milk. We've had the milk. We were, when we first came to the truth, we were given the milk. But we're not to stay with the milk. He's saying here, as he's talking about uh, uh, for us, that we're to be, when we're weaned from the milk, we should be going to the meat. What was uh, the problem with the Corinthians and the Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews? He says, you're dull of hearing. You're not paying attention. You need, you need milk. You can't take the meat. You're choking on the meat. And unfortunately today as well, some are not moving on to get more out of this word that we need today. This is not just something we can read and read and, and just getting the same things. This is a living word that we have before us. This is a living book. And we learn daily from it. New things. 
We don't read through and say, well, I read it once. Well, I'll read it again so I can just remember some of it. No, we read it to live by. This is what we live through. One key to holding on, to holding fast, is that we need to examine our priorities. Paul tells us to be examining ourselves. What are our priorities? Go back to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, and in Psalm 78 and verse 40, he says here, How often did they provoke me in the wilderness and grieve, uh, grieve God in the desert? Yes, they turned back and they tempted the God, uh, God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Verse 19, in the, in the, a little earlier here, he says, uh, they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? They doubted God. They didn't believe him. They couldn't believe God. Here's the, the, the God who brought them out. And yet, for all these years, they continued to turn back from God. They weren't holding on for these years by tempting God. Verse 36 it says, nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. And they lie to him with their tongues. Oh, yes, God, whatever you say, that's what we're going to do. Well, you tell us and we'll do it. Well, see, the next verse after that, what happens? You find they're in trouble again. They didn't listen. They're, they're making golden calves and, and, and idol worship. Going right back to what they wanted, where they came from. Verse 37, he says, Because their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast or holding on to his covenant. They didn't do that. Their priorities were not right with God. Their heart was not right with Him. Sometimes, brethren, like Israel, we go through the motions. We go through the physical motions, doing the physical responsibilities. We're tithing, we're keeping, you know, we're not working on the Sabbath, you know, we're, we're attending services. I don't know whether we're keeping the Sabbath or not the way God designed it for us to keep, because He said to keep the Sabbath holy. But in many cases, people go through the motions of keeping these days. But we're not holding on to the spiritual application of those things that God told us. Not holding on to the spiritual part of it. What's going on, rather, in our minds? Are we holding on to the things that we've committed to do? Yes, we will do that. Out of baptism, we will said, uh, whatever you said, God, we will do that, just like Israel. And we're not our own anymore. But what worldly concepts keep drawing us back so that we start to let go of that grip that we have on this faith, this, this faith that we're holding on to, this truth that we're holding on to. What things are involved in our life that's, that this, gra this grasp, grasp starts to loosen and we start to slip away? What's going on in our minds? Are we holding on to bitterness? Are we are not able to forgive someone when they may have offended or hurt us? God says to forgive and let it go. That's our responsibility. Are we holding on to those things and not holding on to what God wants us to? Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. This is what Israel did. They, they wanted to hold on to something else. Jeremiah 8 and verse 5. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. He says here, Then why do these people stay on their self-destructive path? Why are they on a path, not on the straight and narrow path, they're on a self-destructive path. They're turning away from, from God. Why do the people of Jerusalem refuse to turn back to God? They cling tightly to their lies. King James says, holds fast to deceit. What, what does human nature want to hold to? What they see as important. They hold fast to deceit. They hold fast to their lies and they will not turn around. God says, I listen to their conversations and I don't hear a word of truth. Is anyone sorry for their wrong? Where's the repentance? Where's the spiritual application of God's word? Not the physical. You know, Paul told us in Hebrews, we're to go on to perfection. Not laying again the, the, the foundation things that we had. We're to move on forward. And we do that by holding on and knowing what our priorities are. Or do they say, what a terrible thing I have done? Is there any conscience anymore? Does anyone have a conscience to when they do something or hurt someone? They just move on. Oh, what? It's, it's all about me. It's all about how I feel, what, what I want. 
No, in fact, he says they're all running down the path of sin as swiftly as a horse galloping into battle. Even the stork, verse 7, that flies across the sky knows the time of her migration, as does the turtle dove, the swallow, and the crane. They know what to do. They all return at the proper time each year. They go back to where they know they should be. But my, my people, they don't know the Lord's laws. And there's our priority. Israel did not know God's laws. They let it go. They opened their hand. They, they, they refused to obey God. What did God tell them in Deuteronomy? You know, you bind these things. You know, walk with it day by day with your children. You talk to them about God's word every day. Because they're out there as well. They're, they're the, the next generation target for Satan. And he may use your children along the way to get to you and to me. So we've got to be very careful. Because he, he, has, no, he has no conscience either. He has no, no regard for life. Physical life. And he will destroy. But my people, he says, they don't know God's laws. We need to hold fast to what we came out from. We came out of this world and we are to hold on to the truth. Not hold on to the world. And say things like, well, this is how I am. That's just the way I do things. I've been that way forever. And that's how I am. I, I know I've got to make changes, but you know, God understands. Well, God says here, they don't know my laws. God, they don't understand that God wants growth, wants change. And God is giving us time to make real changes in our life. We don't know when this time is up. No one knows that. But right now, we need to take this seriously and make this priority something that we will address right now. That holding fast to God's truth in His way is something that, that is going to be paramount for us. Turn to Joshua 23. Joshua 23, let's look at instruction from one of God's leaders to a people who were going to continue without him. In effect, this is uh, Joshua's uh, deathbed conversation with, with uh, Israel. Joshua 23 in verse 1 says, After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua by then old and well advanced in years summoned all Israel, the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials, and he said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations in your, uh, for your sake. And it was the Lord your God who fought for you. Don't forget all the things that, we've, that happened to you in your life in terms of turning things around are a result of God's uh, blessing in our life and his guidance and his opening the way for us to change and grow. It was God who fought for you, verse 4. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the lands of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered uh, uh, between the Jordan and the Great Sea in the West. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you, and, he, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. you know, God will do these things. As he did for Israel, he will do these for us. These giants in our lives that are there will be gone. If we yield to God, if we hold to Him, hold fast to that truth, hold fast to that confidence of what God says. It goes on, it says, verse 6, But be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. All of what God tells us, we observe. We don't pick and choose what we like. The Ten Commandments are there for us to live by in their entirety. We don't take the parts out that we don't think are, are, uh, are, are good for us. But Christ amplified them when he came and gave us the understanding of the spirit of the law that Israel did not understand. He says, don't turn aside from the right or to the left. Verse 7, do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. Now, the warning for us is to keep away from the world. Don't go near the world because they will take us away from God. They're gods. It's very subtle that we start giving in to these things. But, verse 8, you are, uh, but you are to, uh, and the King James says, you are to cleave or hold fast to the Lord your God as, he, as you have until now. He says here that the, uh, the Lord, uh, he says no one has been able to withstand you all to this time now. Verse 10, 
He says, and one of you will uh, rouse the thousand because the Lord your God fights for you. And just as he promised, so be very careful, verse 11, to love the Lord your God. Notice, he says, to lo first of all, to love the Lord your God. Verse 12, but if you turn away and I'll ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate them with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations. Instead, they'll become snares and traps, whips in your backs, thorns in your eyes, until you perish from the good land which the Lord God, your God has given you. Now notice again, that, those, those last few verses are after he said, to love the Lord your God. So he's telling us in that context to love the Lord your God and, if you, and, and by not loving the Lord your God is what you're doing. You're showing him by how you're living with the nations around you. You're giving in to these things. And he's saying you're not loving the Lord your God when you do that. We are to stick close to God. And we show that love to God by how we cleave to him and not to these things in the world. And avoid the things that will take us away from God. Now Joshua was faithful to God, and he was totally focused on what was important in his life. And he warned Israel, and we take this warning as well. No, we don't want thorns in our eyes. They're very painful if we're disobeying God. That's the punishments, the, the suffering we're going to bring on ourselves in a life that is away from God. And we can't do that. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6. They just stick together here. Ezra 7 and in verse, beginning in verse 6. It says, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was already a scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So this, this king granted him all this favor. It says that God, uh, because the hand of God was on him, God made it available to him, made it the king do this for him. And continuing on, it says, And there went up from the, uh, some of the children of Israel, and the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the uh, and Ethanims, uh, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And they came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. Uh, for upon that first day of the first month began he to go up to Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem according to the good, uh, to the good hand of his God upon him. Verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach all Israel the statutes and the judgments. God blessed him, allowed the king to give him faith, gave the king uh, him favor with the king to go back. But in verse 10 it says, because Ezra had prepared his heart. He had set his priorities, and they were set correctly. Notice, what did it say? He said, he, set, he seek the law first. And then he did it. And then he taught it. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of God, one, and to do it, and then to teach it. That's the priority. First we seek God's way, then we apply it in our lives, and then as we go along and we learn more and more, then we're able to teach others and show them if they ask and want to know. So that's a progress, uh, the progression rather, of how we, how we do this. And that was his priority. Seek God, do it, and then teach it. I've seen people through the years, and they have variations of this. Like, first they teach it, then maybe they'll seek it, and eventually they leave because they refuse to do it. Their priorities were messed up. They want to teach first. And even if they start learning, what happens? They don't want to do it. Their priorities were wrong. First we learn, then we apply it and then we can show others along the way. Let's look at another example of one who had his priorities right. 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. Let 
there were times when Israel did obey God or did things that were right. And one instance of that, one occurrence of that happening was during the, king, uh, the time of King Hezekiah. First Kings chapter 18 and in verse, uh, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, king of El Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five, uh, twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abi, the, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3. Notice it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Verse 4. He removed the high places and broke the images. He cut down the groves. He broke in pieces the brazen uh, serpent that Moses had made. For in those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and, and, uh, uh, among the kings of Judah. Not any, of, uh, not any there were before him. Verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him there was none like him, all the kings of Judah, uh, nor who were before him. Verse 6. It said, Because he clave... Or in the NIV, it says, He held fast to the Lord and departed not from following Him, but rather He kept His commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And we look through this and we see that Hezekiah, it says, did that was, was, what, what was right before God. He had his priorities right. He was focused on God. And we take our eyes off of the goal sometimes and we lose our focus and then we lose our priorities. We start going after things that are not as important. The first thing that Hezekiah did was what? He, he did that which was right before God. And that means he sought the will of God. That's what it means by doing what was right. He sought the will of God. What would please God What was what he wanted to do. Turn to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15 and in uh, verse 26. God says here, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will, not, and will do that which is right in His sight, again, what is right in God's sight, and you will give ear unto His commandments and keep all His statutes, if we will look to the will of God, as uh, the king did here, he says, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, the Lord, uh, the Lord that heals you. God says he will bless us if we seek his will in our lives. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John chapter 2 and, and verse 16. You know, seeking God, brethren, and, and knowing what he desires is how we have a relationship with him. Having a relationship with God is, is, is uh, the key is to be knowing what his will is for us and to be doing that will, to please him. And 1 John 2, verse 16, it says clearly, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of this world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Has eternal life waiting for what Christ did for us. If we continue to do well and endure. The second thing Hezekiah did was to remove the things that God said were sinful. He sought for God's will, and then what did he do? He did it. He took away the things that were sinful. Verse 4, back in uh, 1 Kings 18, it says, He removed the high places and broke the images. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. For us, brethren, holding fast means that we are drawing close to God by putting away sin, by doing the things that we are learning. Doing the pleasing of God. And that means to change our, what we have been like. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart or mind with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. Be careful what's in your mind, because from out of your mind will come your thoughts, your words, your lifestyle. Verse 44, 24, Put away from you the froward mouth, the perverse lips. Put far from you. Remove these things as God reveals them to us. Let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight before you. Ponder or think through the paths of your feet and let all your ways be established or set in God's path. Establish God's way. Verse 27, turn not to the right hand nor to the left and remove your foot from evil. 
pondering the path, brethren, means that we're not to go about taking life as it comes. That means we're thinking about it. We're prioritizing what's important. That's holding on to these things. Holding on to obedience to God. Holding on to doing His will. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. As we are holding on, as we're applying these things and making these changes in our life, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, uh, Paul says here, Hold fast that form of sound words which you have heard in me, faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ. Hold fast the form of sound words. Let's not get caught up in the ways of the world and what they say and think. Let's look at what God's word says and hold fast to the form of sound things that we learn from, from, uh, from these uh, scriptures. The third thing that Hezekiah had was he had faith in God. Remember it said he trusted the Lord God of Israel and after him there was no other king like him. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. You know, we're told that all the scripture is for our example to learn from. These examples of, of Hezekiah or Ezra or Joshua, they're for our learning, our examples of how we are doing it. Are we having the faith in God? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much more you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice uh, for sin, but a certain fearful looking uh, uh, looking for a, a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour, de devour the adversaries. Let's drop ahead to verse uh, 30, 38 here for time's sake. He says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man shall draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We are to hold fast to the profession of our face and faith and not draw back. Not go back. And we go back, brother, when we let go. When we're not holding on to this. Now, what is faith? Next few verses in uh, chapter 11 tell us. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. So faith is something that we don't see. But we are holding on to it. And in verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And what are we striving to do? To please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. A faith, brethren, is a blessing that we receive from God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And we're told that we are to be growing in these fruits, having them more and more. God makes it available to us. What are we doing with it? Are we exercising that faith? Do we know the promises of God that he makes? Titus chapter 1. We need to believe the promises because that's how we develop the faith. That's how faith grows, when we, when we believe what he says and we apply it in our lives. Titus 1 and verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We have hope of eternal life because God promised it. Do we doubt that? Will we give any of this up? Because we doubt that we have eternal life available? Well, many have because they didn't apply these other things. They didn't have their priorities right. They didn't have the faith in, in, in God's word. They weren't cleaving to him. Isaiah 26 in verse 3. It says, You will keep God in perfect, keep him, rather, he says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Because what? He trusts you. A mind, an individual who trusts in God, he says, their mind is stayed on you. It's founded on God. We are holding to God. Verse 4, he says, Trust you in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah, or God, is everlasting strength. Everlasting strength comes from God. How weak are we? Physically? Spiritually? Sometimes not very strong. 
But he's telling us here, if we trust in God and our mind is stayed on Him, he says, He is everlasting strength for us. The last thing that Hezekiah did was he held fast. It said, He clave to the Lord and departed not from following Him. He held on to it. He had the faith. He knew what the God's Word said. He wanted to please God. And it says he held on to it. He clave to God. Nothing was going to tear him away. The definition of holding something is to have or keep in one's grasp. To keep in the mind or the heart. To stand up under stress. Now I think about holding fast or holding something tightly. I reminded that some years back when I went to New York City, uh, when my grandchildren came up to visit us. And, uh, you know, in the city, there's like millions of people, and it feels like they're all in one spot, you know, but I know they're kind of spread out over a couple of miles, but there are millions of people there walking around. And in an instant, a child could be gone, lost. And I'm, you know, I'm knowing that and seeing it and reading things through the years of what happens when people are not paying attention to their children, I had the responsibility of holding my little granddaughter as we were walking along. And as I'm walking with her, I could see her looking at me like, you know, Grandpa, you're, I'm losing the circulation in my hand. You're holding me so tight. But I was fearful that in some way, if she got away from me or if she slipped away, it would be over. I mean, we had it happen once at Disney World. We were walking through there with the kids, and, and we're going through Mickey Mouse's house with the kids. Oh, look at this, look at that. And everybody gets, you know, taken by that. It's so interesting. As we're walking through, and all of a sudden we turn around and says, Where's the little one? She's not here. Where'd she go? And we started panicking. And I could, you know, you feel the blood draining out of your body because she's gone. And, and she was outside hiding behind one of the bushes, bushes watching us. And we're frantically running around there thinking what ha could have possibly happened. Even in an environment like that where you think is safe. Well, let me tell you, New York City is not Disney World. And I was not going to let her hand go this time. And I held on for her dear life. So I know what holding on means. It means not letting go under any circumstances. Either her mother or her father were going to take her away from me, but that's the only way she was going to get out of my hand. And I wasn't going to let it out, let her out. One of the things that will destroy this holding on is procrastination. Procrastination. It's the attitude of, well, I'll get to it next month, or I'll study it next week, or I'll get to it sooner or later. Or I'll do a study on a problem that I have, I'll get there eventually. We need to be living like Christ will be here tomorrow. Like he's here right now with us. Because, in fact, brethren, Christ is here with us. We need to be living that way. Hezekiah was committed to holding fast. And being committed means not dozing off or putting our weapons down or putting things off that we need to be doing right now. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. Hebrews 3 and verse 6. It says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence, the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, never letting it go. We have to hold fast to that confidence. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and in beginning in verse 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, that you should not be shaken, soon, uh, be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word nor by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means that this day should come, except there comes a falling away first, and that the man of sin would be revealed, who opposes and exalts himself about, above all that is God or that is worshipped, so that he as God is sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We're not to be soon shaken from this by anything. Things we hear, things we see, we're to be locked in solid. Dropping down in verse uh, 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Hold fast. Hold tightly to the traditions that we have been taught through God's uh, servants through the years. Now, holding on also means 
that we are willing to endure trials. Willing to endure trials. Because, brethren, as time goes on, we're going to see more problems as Satan wants to destroy us and attack us. More problems within the church are going to be coming up. Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24 and verse 7. Christ says here, For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in different places. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Just the start of things, as we know what these, this represents, the, uh, the times that we've been living through all these years. And they shall deliver you to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and, they shall be, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold. But notice verse 13. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, he's telling us, look, these things are going to happen. We can't get away from it. This is prophesied by Christ. That many false prophets are going to come. Iniquity is going to abound and the love of many will wax cold but endure to the end. Hold on. No matter how difficult it gets during these things. It's not easy when love wax cold to us. When we think that we're not loved or someone doesn't love us. That's difficult to accept. When we first were called and we read this, I mean, I remember reading here, endure to the end. This is the greatest thing I ever heard. The truth of God, endure. This is wonderful, exciting. And yet as years go by, we see what's happening. As years go by, there are trials. We see people dropping out. Some have gone back. Others not holding to the truth. Others turning against brothers and making, you know, making it difficult for others to go on. These are trials that we're enduring. What's our attitude toward it? Notice in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Job was going through horrific trials. Lost his children, lost all, lost all of his possessions. He's got these boils over his whole body. You know, one little splinter is enough to set you off. Boils over your whole body. Poor Job. Job 2 and verse 9, it says, His wife said to him, Do you still retain your integrity? Now that word there, if we look back at the original word, the word means, do you still hold on to your integrity? Job, with all you're going through, are you still holding on to this? Curse God and die. Get it over with. Why are you doing this? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. What trials are we going through in our life that we think we can't hold on to? The truth and give it up so that we can get out of the trial or think we would get out of the trial. What trial are we going through that is so difficult that we'd walk away from, from God? Well, I mean, all that Job went through, it was so that God could teach him something at the end. In chapter 42, you see what he, what he learned from this horrific trial that he went through. But he didn't quit, and neither can we. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Again, the same word here that was translated retain is, is here when it says be strong and of good courage. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, it is he that, that goes with you and it will not fail you. God will not forsake us. As long as we are holding on to God, he will not walk away from us. If we give this up and decide to go back, it's our choice. We've put the crown down. We've given it to someone else. We've allowed someone else to pick it up. Verse 7, And Moses called un, unto Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be you strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people into the land which the Lord has shown, uh, sworn unto their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, it is he that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail, fail you, neither forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. That is for us. We don't have to fear because God is with us. No matter how difficult the trial, endure. No matter how difficult the pain, endure. 
Hold fast and God will bless us. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 and in verse 16. Talking here about this parable of this, uh, the sower and the seed. Mark 4 and verse 16 it says, and, thee, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word immediately, they received it with gladness. Like Israel. Oh yes, we will do that. When we came up out of the baptism trough. Oh yes, we are going to follow you, you know, right into the kingdom. Anything you say we're going to do. They receive it with gladness. Verse 17. And have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. Only for a while they can endure. Because there's no root there. We haven't put down roots. And afterward he says, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And gone. Now that can't be us, brethren. We can't do that. We need to be those that are sown on good ground. We've got to be nurturing the ground that God has put us in. Not allow it to be strewn with rocks that are going to take us away. If we're not holding fast during the trials of persecution, we will drop away. If we're not holding to that. And be convicted because we know the truth. We know the promises. They're there. We see the examples of others that have gone before us. That's how we do this. That's how we hang on to the trials. By seeing what the Word of God says for us. Not by sitting back and crying about it and waiting for the trial to go away. I know it's painful. I know it's hurtful. And there will be tears of pain and sorrow. But we've got to go on. We can't stop or drop away because of it. And sometimes we don't see God in the picture because we're not looking for God. We're, we're focused away. We're so focused on the trial that we don't see where God is in that trial. That he allowed that to happen for us. So that we can learn something about ourselves. We often judge ourselves. Uh, we often judge ourselves right and, and in that sense. And we're not looking for what God wants us to see. You know, you know every man is right in his own eyes. We, so we say, well, we're right. And then we're not looking, what is it that God's trying to show me through this? Why am I suffering with this? Even though I'm saying I'm right in it, God must be doing something and showing me something. Hebrews chapter 4. We are human. And we will, at times, fail. We're going you know, to have problems. We're not going to do this right all the time. I'm not always cleaving to God. I'm not always holding fast. But again, we have that hope. Hebrews 4 and verse 16, he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in, and to help in time of need. And that need is not just during the trial, but our need is in knowing that we need help to hold on. Because we are weak. And God says he'll provide that for us. Psalm 17. Psalm 17. And in verse 5, Psalm 17 and verse 5, he says here, hold, he says, hold up my goings in your paths that my footsteps slip not. In other words, I am weak, God. Help me to hold on to your way. Help me to hold on to this path that I've, I've put my hand to the plow to follow through with. You give me the help because I am weak and human. And I do fail at times. Give me the strength. Help me to hold on to your ways. Brethren, let's remember that God's Word tells us that we must hold fast to the truth. Hold fast to the faith. Hold fast to the doctrines that we've learned. Hold on to them because they are our salvation. Holding on is a choice that we have to make it critical in making ourselves ready as a bride for Christ's return. Christ gave us the opportunity of salvation. He made the way possible. He gave us His life so we can have that life, of, that salvation available. How committed to it are we? How much are we holding on to it? Revelation 3 and verse 11 in closing. Revelation 3 and verse 11, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast with which, with which you have, that no man take your crown. Hold fast that which you have, and don't let anyone pick up that crown that you may have dropped. Verse 12, he that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more, 
And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. How exciting is that? More than our first love. To know that we have this so close. Let's not drop the crown. Let's hold fast to the end.